Let's talk about impact. Let's say we have two particles like this and they impact each other right here. So they came and hit each other head on in a straight line through their center of mass. This is called central impact. If for example, they hit like this without it being head on, it's called oblique impact. Regardless of how they came to hit each other, when they impact at that point, we can draw a line like this. This is called the plane of contact. Basically, it's where the objects touched each other. If we then draw a line perpendicular to the plane of contact through their center of mass, that's called the line of impact. Really, this chapter is an extension of the conservation of momentum, but we are introduced to an equation called the coefficient of restitution, represented by the letter E. In simple terms, it tells us the ratio of the final velocity to the initial velocity between two objects after they impact. It has a range between 0 and 1. If it's 1, then it's a perfectly elastic collision, meaning no energy is lost during impact. This never happens in real life because energy is lost as sound, heat, and so forth. If it's 0, then it's an inelastic impact. In other words, the two objects stick together and move with a common velocity. We can use the coefficient of restitution to find the velocities of particles after they collide. So let's get started with some examples to see how we can apply this new equation. In this problem, we need to determine the velocity of each of the balls right after they impact. Let's start off by first writing an equation for the conservation of momentum, and we will assume right to be positive. Let's plug in the values we are given. On the left side, we have the mass of ball A multiplied by its initial velocity. Then we add the mass of ball B multiplied by its velocity which is negative since we picked right to be positive. On the other side of the equation, we have the mass of ball A multiplied by its final velocity plus the mass of ball B multiplied by its final velocity. Let's simplify this equation. Next, we can think about the coefficient of restitution. Let's write its equation. Now let's plug in what we know. Don't forget, we are still assuming right to be positive, so the velocity of ball B is still negative. Let's simplify this equation. We now have two equations with two unknowns. Let's solve to get our answers. We get a negative value for the velocity of ball A, which means it was going to the left. Let's take a look at this example, where we need to find the maximum height of the ball after it bounced once. For this question, we need to remember kinematics equations from the early chapters. First, we can calculate the vertical velocity of the ball at point B. And to do that, we can write a kinematics equation. We will pick up to be positive and establish our coordinate system at the location where the ball is being fired from. Remember, in this equation, we are only considering the vertical component of velocity. Let's plug in the values we know. So we have the ball's y component of velocity at location A, plus 2 times the acceleration due to gravity, which is negative since it's downwards. And then we have the final height, which is 2 meters below our origin, plus the initial height, which is 0, since we are at the origin. Let's solve for the vertical velocity. This velocity we found tells us the y component of velocity of the ball at point B. The next step is to figure out the speed at which the ball bounces back up at point B. For that, we can use the coefficient of restitution. Again, we are assuming up to be positive. Keep in mind that the ground doesn't move, so the velocity of the ground is 0 and we can plug in the values we know. So we have 0 for the velocity of the ground, and we know the initial velocity at point B, but it's negative since it's downwards, and we picked up to be positive. Let's solve for the speed of the ball after it impacts the ground. Again, this velocity we found tells us the speed of the ball after it bounced on the ground. The last step is to use the same kinematics equation as last time to figure out the maximum height reached. As before, we will pick up to be positive. One thing to note here is that when the ball reaches the maximum height, its vertical velocity will be zero since it's about to come back down. Keeping this in mind, let's plug in the values we know. We found the vertical component of velocity at point B, so that's the speed at which the ball bounces up. And then SB is zero since that's our origin for this equation. Let's solve for the height, which gives us 1.574 meters. Let's take a look at this example where we need to find the velocity of the ball after it strikes the edge of the table twice. We will first look at point A. 
the ball comes and hits the edge at an angle of 45 degrees from the x-axis. Knowing this, we can figure out the y component of velocity before it strikes the edge of the table at A. So that's 2.5 sine 45 degrees. Now, notice that once the ball hits point A and leaves, the x component of velocity is parallel to the x-axis. So we only need to consider the y component of velocity when we're using the coefficient of restitution equation. We will pick left to be positive. So on top, we have the y component of velocity after the ball strikes a table at point A, and at the bottom, we have the y component of velocity before hitting point A. Also remember, the table doesn't move, so its velocity is zero. Now we can solve for the y component of velocity after the ball hits the table at point A. For the x component of velocity, it'll be the same as the x component of the initial velocity coming in. Now we can look at the velocity of the ball after it hits the edge of the table at point B. This time, notice that once the ball hits point B, the y component of velocity is parallel to the y-axis. So we only need to focus on the x component of velocity when it comes to the coefficient of restitution. We will pick up to be positive. Once again, the table does not move, so its velocity is zero. We also need to remember that the velocity we found in the previous step is actually the initial velocity coming in now. Let's solve for the x component of velocity. The y component of velocity is the same as before. Now that we have both components, we can find the velocity by finding the magnitude, and that's our answer. That should cover the types of problems you will face in this chapter. Thanks for watching, and best of luck with your studies.